Okay. All right, so today at catechism class, what we're going to be looking at uh, is the sacraments in more detail. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask is, I know as, as we've been doing, um, I know you've read the stuff. Do you have any questions? I mean, I have things to say, but do you have any questions that we can start with that would help? Well, let's, let's start by looking at this then. Um, we talked about this a little bit last time, and that's how we number sacraments. The Roman Catholics have seven, and we sort of have seven. And sort of don't. We're going to talk about three things. We'll talk about gospel sacraments, what have historically been known as sacramentals, and then a sacramental worldview. And you can think of those as concentric circles getting bigger and bigger. Gospel sacraments, as the uh, Catechism says in uh, 123, question 123, are sacraments considered to be ordained by Christ and generally necessary to salvation. And generally is a funny word. Uh, we have to use Old English to understand what they mean by uh, generally. It's not, well, it, you might do it. It's general. It's, it means for everybody. General. And that's going to be one of the keys to understanding gospel sacraments. First of all, they're the ones who, uh, that Christ gave an explicit command. Do this. Do this. Um, the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. Baptism, go into all the world and baptize. Um, interestingly, uh, you seem to also say that about foot washing, but we kind of ignore that, I think, because it's logistically difficult. Um, although we do do it at least once a year. Um, but what, what do we mean by generally necessary to salvation? Well, they're for, for all people. Everyone needs to be baptized. Everyone should take communion. So they're not for some people. And that's going to be the big distinction here. The sacramentals, anyone know what they are? The other five that we generally think about? Confirmation. Confirmation. Marriage. Marriage. Healing. Ordination. Now we're going to see the distinction between a gospel sacrament and a sacramental. When it's a matter of salvation, everyone needs communion. Everyone needs to be baptized. Does everyone need to be married? No. Marriage is a good thing. But does everyone need to be married? No. Ordained? No. Um... We go to the confessional. Now this is an interesting one. Does everyone need it? Well, it's inherent in baptism, so you could say yes. Um, we do a confession every week. You could say yes, but we're talking about um, sacramental confession. Uh, the Anglican position has always been that some should. So, and we can talk about what that means. Uh, all can but none must. In other words, private confession, some should, all can, none must. Now, some should is kind of interesting. We think, okay, maybe if you're a murderer. No. What the first prayer book said is, if you are weighed down by doubt and fear, the old word they used was scruple, if you were weighed down by doubt and fear about a, an action you had committed, or guilt, then you should go and make private confession. 
for the relief, relief of scruple and doubt. In other words, that um, it's a lovely phrase. It says, go and open your grief to a discreet and understanding priest for the remo removal of uh, scruple and doubt and the assurance of pardon. The idea being that some of us, at some times in our life, are so weighed down that we need not just someone in the church to say, I forgive you to everyone, but we need to be able to go to someone and say, hey, I did that. And here, you are forgiven in Christ's name. But all of these, the interesting thing about them, they're all good. They're all useful. You might have them in a certain stage of your life, or you might not. But that's why we have to say that they can't be considered generally necessary to salvation, is they don't apply equally to everyone. The other thing is that although these are inherent in the gospel, there are none of these that we could say aren't in the gospel. Uh, they don't have the same clear command as baptism and communion. In baptism and communion, we are told, do this. Healing, for example. We're not told, do this. We're given an if-then statement. If any of you are sick, then go. So it's, it's not that it's so much optional. It's just that it doesn't apply to everyone at all times, whereas baptism and communion do. And then the third thing we'll talk about in a minute is the sacramental worldview, which expands beyond the gospel sacraments, beyond the sacramentals, kind of to everything. Um, before we get there, though, I want to do one more thing and ask you some questions, or see if you have questions. The other thing that's helpful to think about when you're thinking about a sacrament, and this sounds really technical, but it's not going to be in a minute. There's a form, there's a promise, and there's a matter. <clears throat> Classic definition of a sacrament is it's made up of a form, a promise, and a matter. Let's think about one. What's the, uh, the form of a communion? What's well, right here, isn't it? We have a form we use. Uh, priest stands at the altar. He reads certain prayers. Part of the prayers that are really important in our tradition are the words of institution. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. You can see that those are really important because we say them really slowly and we bow. Um, but really the whole service is the form. What's the promise in communion? There's a promise attached to communion. What is it? Think about the words he says at uh, at the institution of the cup. What does he say? Do this yeah, but right before that. Drink this, all of you. This is the cup of my blood shed for you. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. That's the promise. The form is the liturgy we use. And different churches use different liturgies. The bare minimum as we've understand it always was the words of institution. But the promise is for the forgiveness of your sins. What's the matter? What's the stuff? The physical. The bread and the wine. The bread and the wine. Um, baptism. Form. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Promise. New life. Forgiveness of sins. Matter. Water. Luther once said, can water save? And he just laughed. He said, of course not. But water combined with the promise is something different than just water. And all of these have a form, a promise, and matter. I'll give you one bit of trivia just because it's funny uh, and interesting. Marriage is the only sacrament that a clergyman doesn't perform. Who performs the sacrament? Oh, the, uh, the bride and the groom. Yeah. <laughs> I take you. Yeah. People say, do you marry people? I'm like, no, I don't marry people. I only, I only want to be married to my wife. <laughs> I preside at weddings and pronounce a blessing over them, but I don't marry people. <laughs> um, it, the man and the woman are the ministers. Right. They take each other. They take each other. Uh, questions about this before we talk about sacramental so the, 
under the sacramentals when you were talking about the confessional. So that is just a one-on-one. -on -one. That's not the confession that, that we do. Right. The, down here, when we're talking about the sacramentals, we're talking about private confession. Okay. All right. And again, remember the old tradition. Mm -hmm. All can, some should, none must. Gotcha. Okay. My, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, what we do on Sunday morning is called a general confession. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but it is important one way or another to do some form of a deeper confession at times. Yeah. yeah. That's why we do Lent. We have right. to examine. Right. Yeah. And then I was wondering about your own personal confession that you do. Yeah. You know. Um, well, the thing here, again, if we're going to get really technical, I put it that way so people know what it is, what we should call it is absolution. Because we confess all the time. What's distinct about making a private confession is not confessing, although it can be really scary to go to someone and confess. Mm -hmm. What's distinct is that um, that the, uh, the priest speaks the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. on, his, on his account and by the grace of Jesus Christ, I absolve you of all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your sins are put away. That's the power. And it's terribly liberating. We should always live a life of confession. Why we distinguish this down here is it's a bit more intense. And it's with someone who is authorized by the church to pronounce words of forgiveness. Um, some people never do this. Some people do it once or twice in their life when they really hit a wall and realize that they're trapped in by grief, guilt and shame and grief. Other people, I try and make my confession twice a year. Just like I try to go to the dentist. For me, it's good to sit down and review my life with someone, not just with myself. Because I'm not always honest with myself. I need to tell someone. Uh, but again, no one has to do that. I choose to do that. In most of my parishes, I've had private confession times available in Advent and Lent. And I might get three or four people a year. It's not a, it's not a high volume thing. But for those who need it, it can be very liberating. Um, other questions? I got one other thought. The uh, P.F. Torrance, he was a Scottish theologian. He used to say, you can't preach the gospel to yourself. Yeah. You need another voice to tell you you're forgiven. Yeah. One of the most powerful, obviously the most powerful thing in confession for me is the absolution mm -hmm. from an authorized minister. But the very second most powerful thing for me is what Father Doug is saying. Mm -hmm. And that is for me to find the courage to say the things I'm embarrassed and ashamed of and hear someone say, wow, that, yeah, that, that's hard. But because of Jesus, it's put away. So how is that done in the Anglican faith if we don't have confession? I mean, Oh, we have a liturgy for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, but we don't have confessionals. Like, oh, no, it's much nicer. We sit facing each other. Oh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well but here's the secret. It is nicer because you need to see that I'm not disgusted by what you say. Oh, okay. And the other thing is if there's so few people that you have to make an appointment, right. the confessional's not going to work anyway. Yeah. Okay. And, and let me tell you what my Roman Catholic priest friends tell me. They know who it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they know who it is. Yeah. If you've got people who are coming regularly, you recognize that yeah. voice. You recognize. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's, much, it's much more healing. Uh, what I used to do is take people into the altar rail. I would sit behind the altar rail, facing away from them, so they didn't have to look at my face unless they wanted to. I was kind of at a 90 degree mm -hmm. angle. And they had a seat on the other side. And sat there and we talked. Sometimes it took five minutes. Sometimes it took 30. That was up to them. And then finally they kneel, I stand, I plop my hand on their head. And it's powerful. Yeah. If you ever find yourself weighed down by a sin you can't get rid of. And I don't mean get rid of the act of the sin. It's that sin you committed on a Tuesday night in 1973 and it's still <laughs> haunting.